So anyway, uh, hello, my name is uh, Mark Fleury. I'll take actually two minutes to uh, take a little detour and uh, talk to you about life after PhD and stuff like that. Um, I'm a French citizen, Franco-Spaniard, born and raised in Paris, and did uh, a PhD in theoretical physics, um, and uh, then went to industry and uh, retired a couple of years ago, and now I'm back to physics uh, and music. But what I really want to talk to you about is during my uh, master's specifically at the Ecole Normale in Paris, um, I kind of got into a funk, a depression, because even though I could do strict theory, uh, in the words of Predrag, it was deliriously unintelligible, uh, but not in the mathematics formalism. The mathematics formalism is rather straightforward. It's the interpretation of the formalism. What does it mean to a 19th century mechanical physicist, where I was very happy that really threw me for a, for a spin. What does it mean that the generator of this symmetry is the particle, blah, blah, blah. And so as with all with quantum mechanics, I think there is a, uh, we, we have a very powerful formalism, obviously epistemologically it's interesting that by hypothesizing a few symmetries, U1, SU2, SO3, we arrive at the standard model and all the goodness. But where does those symmetry come from? Things like that, 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 that bothered me. And so it stayed as a splinter in my mind for a long time, went professionally to develop code in open source. So uh, developing layers of internet, I know multi-core, I know massively parallel, I know big data, and I think all of that is going to apply to, uh, to this. I'll take a 30 seconds to give you a message of hope for those of you that are in the, in the PhD program. Those are difficult years, I know that. Mine was particularly painful and mediocre. Uh, but there's a life after that. Not only that, but if you go to industry, everything you learn uh, in a PhD program, which is self-sufficiency, hard work, research, etc., serves you well in the industry. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, things like that, those are, uh, those are qualities that, that stick with you. So there's a life after, uh, after, after all of that that you're going through. And with that, let me go straight up to the presentation. This is about uh, quantum walkers, and really what I want to do with all of you is, you know, how do I apply Chaos Book uh, to the study of walkers? The uh, last word, I've really liked the class by Predrag. This is a phenomenal uh, class, very high level. I was very impressed, and I was glad to be able to uh, sit here as a, as a free auditor. I'm, I'm an independent. I'm going to play you the video through the wormhole. We will just have to accept that we'll never know why things behave as they do down at the deepest level of existence. But now, a growing band of rebel scientists think there may be a logical explanation for quantum weirdness after all. And new hope for revealing the ultimate truth of our universe. You, me, and everything else. The trail begins here. Of In parallel during physicist Eve Coudet and his team conduct an arranged series of experiments. They are observing the behavior of silicon joints busting in lockstep Spin. on a vibrating plate. The secret of love never touches the secret of the straight to the void to very thin financial and can be the same as even broadcasting on the liquid surface for for a day situation. Using a camera that shoots a thousand frames. This is a vessel, this is a sign inside there's a vessel. That should be possible because the quantum world and the large scale world play by two different sets of rules. Yet here we see a single process moving rapidly like a quantum particle but behaving like a quantum wave. If you watch this camera, you'll notice that the wave appears to be guiding the droplet. In fact, the wave fields around the doctors develop a memory of the trails they have followed. Despite their random behavior, they follow a small number of paths. Again, this is eerily similar to the behavior of quantum objects. This runs so contrary to popular belief that at first, could they refuse to believe what he was saying? 
in the anatomic disturbance, you only see what you are prepared to see. So this was very obvious that there was a memory, but it took us some time to realize that it was that we were observing, because you, you have to adapt to this uh, new idea. Perhaps most revealing of all, Kuei has reproduced the double slit experiment using his bouncing silicon droplets. The mystery of quantum mechanics is how can things like electrons sometimes behave like particles and sometimes behave like waves? Perhaps this is the answer. They are particles and waves. Of course, this system, though small, is not quantum. Could they walk claim that his experiments show us what is really happening down at the deepest layers of existence? But this man will. All right. So this was a uh, this was a uh, through the wormhole episode. Um, uh, published in 2007, 2008. At the time I did a techno remix of the voices which I thought were very funny. But uh, basically in, uh, in, in high level, what, what, what is it? It's a silicon bath that's vibrating near the Faraday instability. Uh, what that means is that any wave excitation will create a standing wave. So first important thing, if you drop something on a, on a lake, you have a sine wave that's a transient. We're focused here on the Bessel a standing wave that appears because we're near the Faraday instability of the silicon bath. Uh, the second high level construct that we need to uh, remember from this is that this is truly the dynamics of a particle associated with a wave. We do never consider just the particle, just the wave. It's a symbiotic system and the dynamic of that system is the dynamic of the composite object. When we think about dual um, uh, you know, a uh, uh, particle wave association, this is really a physical imp a representation of that and a Bessel standing wave is the wave. Uh, uh, and, and the experiment done by Coudet in Paris uh, gave us the QM analog of slit interference. That field has uh, increased a lot lately. Uh, so Coudet and Fort at the Ecole Normale in Paris, my alma mater, uh, still running experiments. I visited Coudet about a month ago uh, and in fact his latest results are the more interesting uh, to, to, to us as, as, as chaos guys because what he does is he puts his silicon walkers under a central potential, under an elastic potential. It's a very clever experiment where he ferromagnetically charges the, the droplets and then puts a, a field around it and that creates a central minus Kx potential. And with this bounded potential we start seeing uh, uh, periodic orbits in the, in, the, in the system and periodic orbits that are very interesting because they recreate uh, a mathematically exact representation of spin which was uh, meaning with the, the double quantization at Landau, etc. Uh, when we thought it was exclusively in the, in, the, in the microscopic domain. Here we have a classical albeit non-trivial dynamic and the interesting part is that it recreates a lot of the, of the quantum mechanics behavior. Uh, since then, I visited uh, uh, Anderson in Cambridge. He invited me to visit after I published uh, my first simulation on, on their stuff. Uh, they do more of the theory of QM. Uh, whereas Coudet is very, oh, I'm just an experimentalist. These guys run with the ball and wave their arms a lot, explaining special relativity, quantum mechanics. Very interesting, more, more theoretical work. Uh, in the very technical and precise, there is the team of John Bush at MIT. Uh, he does a lot of mathematics. He has reproduced the experiments. And on the website I'm going to give you at the end, there's a lot of his videos that on, on .wave.org. Uh, but it really is the uh, hydrodynamic description in all mathematical gory detail. Uh, there's a new team in Belgium that just received a million euros to study the walkers and their application to QM. So the first point is that this is a nonlinear dynamics. Basically the particle, if this is the field and the particle is a walker walking through the right, the straight walker, you can see that the particle signified here by the big dot is always a little bit ahead of the curve. So if you start bouncing and you, you bounce and you create a, a Mexican hat, at first you bounce in the bottom, so that's stable. But as you change the, the frequency of the oscillation, John Bush shows that you have a two to one regime that appears. And what that means is that for two oscillations here, you have one of these guys. So the net result is that this guy, the particle lands on top 
of the Mexican hat. Now has a slight acceleration due to gravity, picks up a speed randomly, and that becomes a stable walking system. So it's a self-excited system that will have an emergent phase that is the walker. Uh, the acceleration, so there's two acceleration, acceleration from all the past waves and the notion of memory tells us how many waves and then the central force experiments are very interesting to us and that's what we're going to model. Here is the quantitative description uh, in, the, in the Newtonian view. Uh, it's very straightforward. X is your position on the surface. It has a con control parameter alpha equivalent to a, to a mass. Uh, it has a uh, it has a fluid uh, a contribution proportional to the speed. That's how it gets. Uh, it's a viscous force. That's how it gets stopped. This is the central force. So this is what we use to model. What I use to model uh, for Chaos Book because this is what creates the, the the captive orbits and the periodic orbits. Otherwise, you just have a straight walker. And here is the interesting nonlinear bit that comes from the association of the particle and the wave. What this says is that we have a gradient contribution, the gradient of the, of the slope, that gives us an acceleration. So it's proportional to the derivative of the Bessel, which is a Bessel order one, and we sum over the memory. This, the memory represents the number of waves that we sum. So if we have very low memory, we just have one wave, but in higher memory, we sum more waves, and the, the quantum uh, behavior appears in the high memory regimes. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. And we have a damping uh, time factor that the, the Bessel de decays in time exponentially. So that's the, the, the quantitative description. Memory is worth spending 30 seconds on. Here are three shots of the same walker with uh, the memory increasing. This notion of memory is central to the walkers. It's here we have very low memory and it resembles a Bessel. This is a Bessel function seen from above. And as you increase uh, the memory, you start having contribution from every little dot emitting a Bessel, like a boat on the lake. Okay? You're looking at the wake left by the walker. Okay? And it starts resembling this shape, which we call the bomb, well, I call the bombers, and they're observed very clearly by Bush, they're observed very clearly by Coudé as well. It's this winged structure. And notice how this particle is creating a front plane wave that's propagating with it. Any particle that's like this, that's propagating straight, is actually a, 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 a plane wave associated with it. That's an interesting bit. And in very high memory regimes, even in the, in the back, you can see this egg crate kind of structure uh, happening in the wake of the, of, the, of, the, of the walker. The point of these three uh, drawings is to show you that there is uh, a memory uh, changes the wave field a lot. All right. So this is what interests us. In the case of a central potential, we observe very interesting QM behavior. Uh, particle wave duality is sort of a given here, the single slit and double slit experiment. What happens is the particle goes through a slit, but the wave obviously goes through both. Right? So it's this mental construct that we associate with QM. Well, is it a particle? What hole is it going to that gives us headaches? But really the association of it is a very clear uh, a pictorial mind to have for single and double. Uh, there is a notion of tunneling that I don't like very much, very frankly. I think it's a little bit funky. There's coralline observed by Bush, meaning if you are in a, in a cavity that's circular, it will start taking the eigenmodes of the cavity. And that's very interesting because the presence, it's the Schrodinger equation, then says it's just an average description of this thing over time. And so the quantities, the averages, the statistical averages we're used to appear uh, in, the, in, the, in the long term as eigenmodes of the cavity the walker's walking in. I'm at 10 minutes now? Yeah. Uh, we observe lambda quanti uh, quantization and it's a spin implementation. It's an exact representation, mathematical representation of, of spin. Uh, so I'm here to apply Kale's book uh, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So <clears throat> this is really what the things I, I, I want to leave with you and, and get feedback on. So I, I, I love Kale's book. I, uh, I'm very impressed. The first 12 pages were the best differential geometry class I've ever had and group theory class I've ever had even though I've done a lot of that. Uh, chapter 13 is very clear to me. You know, I wish it started there. Well, you just put a net and see what comes back. Yeah, well, I didn't need two months of differential geometry to do that. Uh, but, okay, I understand chapter 13, but for the rest I'm very fuzzy and I need your, your help, very frankly. 
My goal is to capture the orbits and their weight. So I've, I set these, these equations on, on computers. I've done field simulations and I want to run them and then I want to find those periodic orbits that, 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 that we see. Uh, there is a symmetry SU2. I think I'm very clear on the multi-shoot approach of chapter 13 because Coudé models Cassini curve, so all of these orbits that, that represent an electron orbit really can be approximated by a family of curves. Uh, just the rotational symmetry, Professor. I'm, uh, I, I'm being fancy. My apologies. SO2. Thank, okay, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> but the Cassini curves, I think, can help us uh, see the multi shoot approach and at least reconstruct what Kudé has observed. Uh, my big question is you know, I love the symbolic dynamic, I recognize the power of it, I would love to, to apply it here. What's my symbolic dynamic? You know, it's not very clear. I also want to throw out there that. You know, visually, when I see these things, I, I, I compute them today, I, th I see these things running around, visually the field becomes stable. So maybe my symbolic dynamic could be uh, a measure of the field itself, so how, as opposed to the trajectory of the particle. I have no idea, maybe more, more advanced topics. And, uh, okay, the last thing, I have two minutes left on my clock. Um, this is a great website, uh, .wave.org. This is run by one of my friends called Heligon in France. Heligon is, uh, is like us, he's gone through a PhD, then went to industry, he's bored as hell, and he runs these experiments in his basement. Not only that, he, I took him to meet Coudé, Coudé was, uh, was talking with him two hours, he has all the literature, all the videos on his website, the website is .wave.org, and we have a minute and a half for questions. Is there any analog of superposition in this um, system? That you know of. So the idea, obviously, superposition and the the, the, the collapse idea uh, is, is 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 central to quantum mechanic understanding. Uh, what Coudé does in his last paper, which is not yet published, but he gave it to me when I when when I visited, essentially says, well, if you compute this particle, okay, if you if you observe this particle over a long time, uh, and you compute the average. Uh, the average is e e mathematically equivalent to the quantum mechanic thing, but it's an average. But if you take a picture at one time, it's, at one, it's in one state. So in this mental approach, there is no such thing as a wave packet collapse. Right? It's not that... And if you take the point of view that the electron is not one electron, but it's really 10 to the power 60 Planck scale things, knowing that the Avogadro number is 10 to the power 23, and with Avogadro we have thermodynamics and statistics, you know, there's room to think that at 10 to the power 60, you'll have monster statistic behavior. So this interpretation is purely deterministic and causal, and basically says QM is an emerging thing. It is not a real thing, it's just a statistical description. There is no such thing as superposition of states, it's just you have 10 to the power 60 things doing their own thing, and we observe the averages. Tom. When I first saw this, I think it's important to understand that this thing, that the uh, table or the pool of silicon is being shaken all the time, and that that's where you're constantly, that's yes. where the, uh, yes. the viscous damping is over. Uh, uh, yes. Tom, Tom McCarthy uh, is here at Predrag, and by the way, I wanted to thank Tom, because chaos chance, I ran into Tom into a Starbucks about two years ago. And we talk, I was doing gravity at the time, and Tom being the mentor and coach and exceptional person he is, meets me every week to talk about this for one or two hours. So that's a message to all of you. Pass it on at some point. Mentor, mentoring and coaching is important. The question is, you, men you mentioned the same thing, Professor. There is always a parametric excitation. We are always injecting energy in the system because the system is, profound, is intrinsically dissipative. And we only observe the quantum mechanic behavior when we compense for this dissipation and observe standing Faraday waves. Uh, so it's a non, the, the quantum mechanic appears in the non-dissipative regime. This is beautiful because we have a classical system where we take care of the dissipative behavior and observe quantum mechanic. If we take this and project into electromagnetic waves where there is no dissipation, the analog holds.
doesn't it bother you that you're using a 3D classical system to approximate a 2D quantum system? That, that is a great question. Control? That is a phenomenal question. Right the question is, does it bother you that you're doing 3D uh, be, uh, and, and claiming that 3D, you know, when, when this is just a 2D? Here I use a 2D system, but let me address this question. Uh, in theory, and first when I studied this, I thought, well, maybe we need to generalize this to a 3D kind of excitation with a 3D Bessel wave around it, and what happens then? Obviously, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, there's various things that make me say the 2D is interested in and on itself. First of all, we're modeling the walkers, so this is relevant to the walker community that does this experiment. Second of all, I come from gravity. And if you look at the only known derivations of uh, Einstein's general field equations, uh, as opposed, there's an hypothesis from Einstein. He hypothesizes the format. Uh, Sakharov in the 70s did a, uh, a derivation that came from a 2D Jacobian, meaning assuming that you have 2D deformations. Uh, modern brain theory says they're 2D. So I believe that even for the deeper question that you ask, the 2D treatment may be enough, namely fermionic matter may be 2D deformations. You know, it's surface hydrodynamics, and so what happens is the z-coordinate becomes a function of the, of the, of the x and y and t is the real question. And the deeper answer is that if you believe in, uh, you know, that the work in the holographic universe, when you go through and you calculate the, you know, it basically says that black holes, you can, it depends on the surface area. It doesn't depend on the, on, on the volume. That's probably the deeper answer there. It may be 2D. Uh, Gravity is a 2D phenomenon. That's a very interesting insight, actually. I'll explain that to you. That, that was Sakharov insight, but Kleiner. Answer, the simple answer is that in hydrodynamics, even when you're doing ocean waves and stuff, it becomes basically a 2D system because the, the z coordinate is induced to become a function of, of, the, uh, of the other uh, orthogonal coordinates and time. And when you have the particles on this flat, you know, planar surface, the, the um, energy contained, energy barrier to lift yourself out of a plane into the third dimension, is, is, it's, it, the barrier is just too great to overcome with energy in the system. So it is effectively two-dimensional. It just, you can't get past that energy. But I think it's, it's, it, fermions are 2D objects. That's, that's what comes from Kleinert, too, in, in, in condensed matter. But that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank to Mark again. Um, <laughs> <laughs>